Hebrew kingdom building. We're starting a new book today, and and uh, well, I have to just do that. How did that happen like that? What's what's going on? Yeah. Anyway, man, that's strange. All right, but um, in English, um, it's the Book of Numbers, but in Hebrew, it's what? But Mead Bar. This is. In English, they just call it the Book of Numbers, I guess, because they show you know, a bunch of numbers in the beginning. That's <laughs> crazy. Mm -hmm. I wonder who came up with that, because this is not what this book is about. <laughs> the me bar is a totally different, means something totally different. What does it mean? Right. This is about the wilderness wandering. This is about the, that's what this book is about, the me bar. This book is gives the whole account of the 40 years of the Yasharel in the wilderness. It literally starts from the beginning, which is in the, literally the first year, uh, the second month roughly, I believe, yeah. All the way to the end of the 40 years. So this gives, the, if you wanna get the best, largest account of the wilderness wanderings, it's Bamid Bar, that's the book. That's the wilderness book. That's why it's called Bamid Bar. Um, Ba is a prefix, it just means in, and then the mead bar is actually the word for wilderness. Y'all get it? It don't even say in the wilderness, it says in wilderness, really. Uh, technically is what it says, in wilderness. Because if it was in the wilderness, it would say ba ha mead bar, right? Ha mead bar, it don't say that, it's ba mead bar, in wilderness. Um, the wilderness, is actually, uh, it's the mem, and then you got the bar. What does the bar mean in English? The word, right. So the wilderness is all about a word. It's the place where, where a lot of words are coming. Y'all see what I'm saying? It's all, I told y'all, when it comes to the scriptures, it's all about receiving the word, all the scriptures. Yeah. And that's the wilderness. That's where we are at today. That's what we are at today. And go to um, Ezekiel 20. We read this all the time, but we're going to look at it real quick. We actually read this every day as we go under the rod, but we're still going to read it again just for context. Well, not every day, but every Shabbat, I mean. Every Shabbat. Ezekiel 20, everybody there? Go to verse, uh, I believe it's 27. Yeah. Let everybody get there first. <laughs> y'all y'all are hilarious. I was trying not to laugh, but then y'all made me laugh. Ezekiel twenty verse twenty seven. Y'all got it? No, that ain't what I was looking for. Hold on. I think it's thirty seven. 
37. Mm. All right, let's start with verse 35. Y'all ready? Everybody there, let's go. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples. Wait, let's start with verse 34. 34, okay. 34. I will, you br I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries. So you see what the peoples means? He said, I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered. So y'all know the understanding of the peoples, it means it's, 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 it's the, the context is about the other nations, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring you from the places where you're scattered, from the peoples. He's talking about the other nations, the yes, nations. Read it again, verse 34. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out. Okay. So Yahuwah is making this promise. This is where we're at. This is what's happening now. That's why we read this at Patrick when we go into Rotary Shabbat. Because it's about, this is about us. This is about what's happening right now. So um, Yahuwah said he was going to regather us. And he's going to gather us out, uh, from the places where he has scattered us from out of the peoples, from the peoples and out of the countries. Okay. In verse 35, what's the next thing? And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples. What? The wilderness of what? Of the peoples. Is that Mead Bar? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Of the peoples. Keep going. And there, I will plead my case with you face to face. Mm -hmm. Just as I pleaded my case with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Misraim. So what this is showing is that we, we were part of this regathering. This is what Malik Yahushua was talking about. We was part of this regathering. And then he said that he's re, when he regathers us, he's going to bring us into the wilderness of the peoples. Mm. So it's a uh, basically it's this regathering, but see, there's a process that he, that he, that, that we we he didn't he regathered us, but we're still amongst the other nations. He regathered us from the places where he scattered us and and gathered us together, but he did not bring us into the promised land yet. He said, "No, I'm going to regather you and bring you into the wilderness of the peoples." Mm -hmm. You get it? Yes, sir. So we're regathered, we're together, but now we're going through this process called the wild. We're, we're in this wilderness amongst the nations that where we were scattered. That's what that's that's what the wilderness of the peoples is. Mm -hmm. Y'all really getting what I'm saying? Because that's where we're at right now. This is the wilderness. We're in the wilderness. Right. It's called the wilderness of the people. Okay. All right. Read it one more time. Thirty-five. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples. And okay. there I will plead my case with you face to face. So that doesn't really say plead my case. It really says I will judge you. It's Shafat. That always means judge. Um, it's not like, because I used to think of me, oh, I'm going to be pleading with you. Please do right. I'm going to plead with you face to face. I'm going to plead. No. Shafat actually is about um, Sheen. There's this regathering that will happen, which is what that's what the awakening was. But when the regathering happened, he didn't bring us straight into the promised land. He regathered us and had us right here regathered. And at this time, he has us, he, he deals with us, he's with us. This is the awakening. But he's judging right now. He's judge, this is a process of judging the people who's, who's part of this awakening now. You see what I'm saying? So that's why Yahuwah had us put that rod up, and during that whole, during this whole process, there was a process of judgment, judging that happened. What the Most High was was dealing with us to see, and if we qualified to be a part of his his uh, his people. But keep reading. I plead with you face to face, verse thirty six. Just as I pleaded my case with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Misraim, so I will, will plead my case with you. Says Yahuwah Lua. Because what we're reading, uh, what we're going to be, what we're reading about in the book of Bamidbar is that Yahuwah did the same thing. Yeah, he redeemed the children of Israel out of Mitzrayim and he gathered them, but he didn't bring them straight into the promised land even then, did he? 
Nope. He did not do it. Mm -mm. First, he brought them into the wilderness where they were still amongst the other nations. It was like a wilderness of the peoples. That's why the scriptures say it was like, like he did with our ancestors in the wilderness. Y'all know they weren't just in the desert by themselves. There was all kinds of nations in the wilderness. And y'all will see, was, and we'll go through the book of Numbers. They had the war against the Malachites. They had the war against these, all these other people. Uh, Yahuwah actually had to take them through a different route because the Philistines was over there. So they went this other route. Um, and then they're going to be fighting against, um, you know, we, we, we'll see. They're going to be fighting against uh, Moabites. Um, it was all kind of nations within the, that area. Y'all know because um, uh, Moshe actually lived there for 40 years. That same wilderness, Moshe already had lived there for 40 years. That's where he was living. Remember the burning bush happened right in Sinai. <laughs> the burning bush happened right there. A lot of people don't realize that. They just called it something different. So that's where we're at now. He'll plead with us face to face. Keep going. Uh, verse 37. I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. So that's part of the wood. So you get into the wilderness of the people, and then while you're in the wilderness of the peoples, that's being a part of this awakening. You're in, now you're going through the wilderness of the people, and Yahuwah is going to make you pass under the rod. That means he's going to inspect you. Now there's an inspection that happens. See what I'm saying? So the pass under the rod, that is um, sacrificial language. That's what the priest did because only the, the sacrificial animal had to be without spot or blemish. So they would have the rod. They would have the animal pass under the rod. They would make sure it was without spot or blemish, that it a, that a Sathub's offering, that it could be, on, be killed and put on the offering, offered up to the Most High. Had to be without spot or blemish. Uh, if make it pass under the rod, they see that it's, Okay, hold on. It looked like there's something wrong with that one. No, no it can't go. No, uh -uh. Mm -hmm. it's sending it back. Mm -hmm. It's an inspection, the rod of inspection. That's what it is. You're me with that rod, you're measuring because um, a lot of with the sacrifices, a lot of the sheep, based on the offering, a lot of the animals had to be of a certain age. You know, of a, 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 a you know a one year old. You know, a, a, a lamb of one year old and different things like that and they come in hold on man that thing look like it's about three months old man no oh. <laughs> no so <many> right. <laughs> the priests were the inspectors um so the most high he starts inspecting you how does he inspect you he uses he has you pass under the rod he's inspecting your heart mm -hmm. your intentions yes, sir. you know your mindset your perspective etc he is inspecting this sheep to see if you qualify to be a whole burnt offering. Because really, man, what this is really about is us presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice. Remember, a broken spirit and a contrite heart, that's what the most high, that's what is pleasing. And, and that, uh, we were talking about that in the midrash, that really means you being a whole burnt offering. A broken right. spirit and a contrite heart. That's why Yahushua would say stuff like, blessed is the poor in spirit. Mm. Blessed is the meek, because he will inherit the earth. All those, he would say these things like that. Mm -hmm. What did he say? Blessed are the poor in spirit, because it's him, the children of Alua. What did he say? There's the kingdom of Alua, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why he was saying stuff like that. The poor in spirit, that's somebody who is a whole burnt offering. Right. A broken and contrite heart. That's what he was talking about. Those who have a broken and contrite heart. Yes, sir. Verse 37, I will make you pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. So remember, this is a part of this. This, on, this is happening to those who are in the wilderness of the peoples. Okay? I'm a, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. That happened in the wilderness in Sinai too, didn't it? Yahuwah was started inspecting them and then he made them go into the bond of the covenant. That's the Ten Commandments. Mm. He did. Yahuwah made them go and as soon as they got in the, into the wilderness, now I'm going to make you go into this, co go into this covenant with me. Mm. Yes, to where if you do through, man, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless y'all abundantly. Y'all going to be so, man, y'all going to flourish. Y'all going to be heading out to tell all these things. But man, if you go against these covenants, man, all these curses will come upon you. 
Man, if you just observe and my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Yasharel forever. All these blessings will come if you just if you just heed these heed this word. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. All right, verse 38. So look what happens. So I'm gonna bring you into the bond of the covenant. And then verse 38, what happens? I will purge the rebels from among you. I will what? Purge the rebels from among you. Man, so that's interesting because Yahuwah said, I'm going to regather you from the peoples. And I'm going to bring you into this wilderness. I'm going to inspect you. And then he says, I'm going to bring you into a covenant. Then I'm going to purge the rebels from among you. That's literally what happened. That happened to us. I will purge the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. What else does he say though? Look at this. I will bring them out of the country where they dwell. That's the awakening. But keep going. But what? They shall not enter into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am Yahuwah. This is why the Most High didn't just bring us straight into the promised land once he woke us all up. It's a whole process of this wilderness process, the wilderness of the peoples, where he's inspecting people, he's inspecting us, he's uh, he purges out the rebels, purging out the uh, those who transgress against him, and so he's saying like straight up, like man, look, I'm gonna bring you out of the country where they dwell, but they shall not, because that's what's happened. We all came out once we woke up. We all came out of we all came, it's like we came out of the, uh, um, the matrix. We came, we woke up, we came out of Babylon. But they shall not enter the land of Israel. That's the, uh, the rebels want. The transit, but that's the process of that being done for first. Then it says, then you will know that I am Yahuwah. All right? So let's go back to Bar chapter 1. Because this is the same process that happened in this wilderness in the, in the book of Bemidbar. Bar. Oh. And the rebels were mad about that. Man, you said we were going to go into the promised land. Man, I ain't trying to be in this wilderness. <laughs> we're not in the promised land yet. You know, did that on purpose to judge them. People thought, they, people thought they were good because Yahuwah uh, had redeemed them out of Mitzrayim. They thought they were stupid, but Yahuwah redeemed everybody out of Mitzrayim. All you have to do is put the blood on the doorpost. It's the same thing. I mean, with us, I mean, he woke everybody. He, he, anybody who wanted to keep the commandments, and, and I mean, he woke everybody. Any, anybody could have been an awakening. Right. That don't mean you threw. Now the process of being molded and shaped and, and sanctification happens after the awakening. That's why um, some are awakened to, to damnation. Some are awakened to life, but some are awakened to damnation or to, to the second death. They're awakened to be exiled again, to die again. Because remember, the awakening is a resurrection. The awakening is a resurrection. All right, let's read uh, verse 2. No, let's read verse 1. Now Yahuwah spoke to Moshe in the wilderness of, of Sinai, in the tabernacle of meeting on the first day of the second month. When? First day of the second month. That's on Rosh Kodesh. Yeah, so Yahuwah spoke to Moshe in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle. It was on Rosh Kodesh. Moshe was probably giving up the Rosh Kodesh offerings. So the first day of the month, on the second month. After they had come out of the land of Mishraim, and what did Yahuwah tell them to do? Well, well, let's look at this, though. Let's look at this real quick. This is Shemot chapter 40, verse 17. 
It says, and it came to pass in the first month of the second year, when? On Rosh Kodesh, that the tabernacle was raised up. So Moshe raised up the tabernacle, fastened its sockets, set up its boards, put it in its bars, and raised up its pillars. Let's read uh, Bemibar chapter 1 again. Verse 1. Calm. Verse 1, my apologies. Now Yahuwah spoke to Moshe in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of meeting. And when was that? On the first day of the second month. That was on the Rosh Kodesh on the second month. When? Which year? In the second year. In the second year. After they had come out of the land of Misraim, saying. Hold on. Y'all see this, though? So this happened a month, exactly a month after the tabernacle was erected, y'all. The tabernacle was, re was erected the first day of the first uh, month of the second year. Rosh Kodesh, um, month one. And so by Rosh Kodesh month two, then Yahuwah told Moshe, okay, I want you to uh, do a census. It's not really census. But um, basically do a Rosh. It's about the Roshim. Uh, counting the heads. Man, why is it doing that? Man, that's strange. Something must be something on the settings. But I don't got time to figure that out right now, so we're just going to roll with it. All right. Verse 2. Take a census of all the congregation. So that word children. census is Rosh. That word census is Rosh. It's about the Roshim. This is about the heads of households. You get it? This is about the Roshim. Remember, like, um, that's why um, Bakir Yamin Manu is called Rosh, because he's the head of a house. And they, uh, take a Rosh. In other words, to, uh, to, to, to count the Roshim. That's why I said census in English, because it's, you know, in English is about counting. Uh, but usually when the census, I think they count everybody. But see, when you're talking about the Roshim, you're just talking about the heads of households, those who are, number one, men, because the Rosh are, is a man. So you can, if you're looking at the Hebrew, you automatically know, okay, this is talking about um, seeing who, who all are the men that are accounted for in this order. You know what I'm saying? Um, and also, they're, they're Roshim, so they have to be, in a sense, kind of like a head, like a head of household. They have to be an adult, in other words, in a sense. Um, not 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 a hundred percent, but generally speaking, the Roshim are usually uh, there's 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 a lot of exceptions. Cause I know Josiah, he would be considered a Rosh. He was not a, an adult at first, um, and then the priests, um, I believe, they are considered a Roshim uh, a lot younger. So there's some exceptions. But I'm just talking from generalities, though. Um, you know, take a Roshim of all the congregation of the children of Israel. Keep going. By their families, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, every male individually. So it's by their families, by their mishpaka. So take a rosh of all the congregation of the, and that's, that's, that's where children of Israel, that's, that, you know, that's Benai Israel, so that can just really mean sons of Israel as well, you know. And I do believe that's the case here. Yeah. By their mishpaka. So the, the roshim is going to be accounted for by their mishpaka, by their families, by the, their Ab's house. According to the number of names, and I believe is that number is that Picard? Let me see. No, it's not. That's Miss Parr. Okay. 
Every male individually. Mm. From how old? From 20 years old and above. This is from 20 years old and above. All who are able to go to war in Israel. So this is about the warriors. And then this is the word 20, but this is actually associated with 10. 10. Uh, the word actually for 20 is almost the exact same word as 10. So the word for 10 is uh, uh, is is uh, Asar, and 20 is Esrim, so it's just Asar plural, Esrim, you see what I'm saying? So actually the number, two, the number 20 is associated with being submitted, with being obedient, 20 years old and above. These are people who are submitted, these are soldiers. 20 years old and above. Dang, I didn't work when I did that. Okay. Let's keep going. You and Aharon shall number them by their armies. And with you there shall be a man from every tribe each one the head of his father's house. Verse 5. These are the names All of right. the... All right, so here we go. So when it says, you and Aharon shall number them, that word for number is not mispar. You and Aharon shall... That's the word pikad. That's why we got to look... It's important to look at this in Hebrew. It's, it's saying a lot more than what... So you and Aharon shall visit them. Pikad is about a visitation. It's about a visitation, um, a visitation for judgment or a visitation for blessings. Um, usually what, that's what the feast days is all about because those are the times where the most high put cards, the mishpaka is um, in a special way is during, you know, that happens on the Shabbats too, but especially on the weekdays, I mean on the feast days, I'm sorry, um, a pakad usually happens, a visitation from the most high, pakad. So you and Aharon shall pakad them by the armies. So they are visited. The visitation is about making sure they're they're accounted for, mm -hmm. and um, you know making sure that they're like it's it's time for order to be established. You see what I'm saying? Right. Um, because there's been a lot of cuttings that happen. You know, um, so. This is in the second year in the wilderness. So that means all the stuff that happened like with the, uh, the, um, the golden calf incident, you know, those things like that, 3,000 was killed and some other stuff like that that happened. Um, you know, the 10 commandments were given, you know, all these things like that uh, had already happened. That happened in the first year. Um, a lot of cuttings happened, there was a lot of, trials there was some judgments and now they were at Sinai for a while I think they were at Sinai for about a year roughly so nevertheless nevertheless um it's the second year so nevertheless it's time for order to be established okay they've been saved out of uh, Misraim they've been redeemed out of, of out of Egypt Okay, it's time to move forward. Um, now there's been a lot of cuttings. The golden calf incident happened. They worshiped the golden calf. 3,000 people were killed. These, the Ten Commandments were given. The covenant was made. Now it's time to establish order. The tabernacle was just erected, y'all. Think about it, y'all. Just a month ago. Oh, snap. The tabernacle was erected. Oh, we got to establish order. What were the children of Israel doing before this? That whole year? They were just chilling. They were all over the place, probably. They probably was just man camped up wherever. You know what I'm saying? They probably just laid out wherever they felt like it. And the most I was like, okay, Moshe. It was Rosh Kodesh, Moshe, in prayer time. At the time, like, all right, look, I need you to. Go ahead and do this. I need you to set this, man, go and establish some order. Get some stuff established. Sure. 
Because, man, it's a whole nother level. Now the tabernacle's been erected. How y'all gonna protect the tabernacle? How you gonna make sure don't nobody, um, you know, uh, 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 one of the children uh, runs into the um, Holy of Holies or something? Or runs into the holy place? <laughs> they basketball rolled into there uh, <laughs> on accident, you know? Doggone it. They running in the holy place to get the, to get the basketball. <laughs> How they going to have order now that the tabernacle's erected unless they establish it? See what I'm saying? Right. And so this is where we're at. Let's keep going. Okay. <clears throat> verse 3. Where was that? I forgot where was that. Yeah, verse okay. 3. Come on. From 20 years old and above, all who are able to go to war in Israel, you and Aharon shall number them by their armies. And with you there shall be a man from every tribe, each one the head of his father's house. Yep. These are the so, names of the men. So Yahuwah is choosing, the, who's, the, Yahuwah is making these choices. There shall be a man from every tribe. Each one will be a Rosh of his Ob's house. Keep going. These are the names of the men. These men were named by Yahuwah. Who shall stand with you from Reuben, Eliezer, and son of Shador. So did, um, did Moshe get, uh, get to choose who these heads were going to be? Hmm. Did they did they have a vote? Was there was there a voting process to see who was gonna be the head of the tribes? Oh, oh. Hmm. Yahuwah. While Moshe was in prayer, he said these are gonna be the heads of these tribes. Like this is how it be, y'all. Hmm. This is how it be. These are the names of the men who should stand for you. Eliezer, the son of Shador. And it goes through, uh, you know, Simeon. Then it goes, uh, okay, look at uh, verse seven, read verse 7. From Judah, Nasham, the son of Aminadab. So Nadab means like nobility. I don't know if y'all remember what I did the breakdown on Nadib or Nadab. That means nobility. So Ami is uh, my people. My people of no are no of nobility, maybe something like that. I mean, um, Nashan, that's about um, like a Nakash, like a man, that's like a serpent, uh, enchanting, yeah. But nevertheless, uh, from Yehuda, the leader who was chosen was Nashan. He was the son of Aminadab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember we talked about this. Go to um. Exodus chapter 6 and read verse 23. Everybody there? Arhan took to himself Elisheba. Elisheba. So that is Elisheba. Uh, maybe a Lua oath, Maya Lua. Oath, yeah, something like that. Uh, Eli Sheba. And who was Eli Sheba? Keep going. Daughter of Amena Nabad. Keep going. Sister of Nashan. Oh, okay. As wife. And she bore him Nadab, Abahu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. So that means that. Because Nashon was the leader of the tribe of Judah. So Aharon's wife is Nashon's sister. So Aharon married the leader of the tribe of Judah. He married his sister. So the priesthood 
was always a mixture of Levi and Judah. Because remember, the priests were not Levi. The priests were the sons of Aaron. The priests were made up the sons of Aaron, which were the people who were from this combination of Levi and Judah. Judah and Levi. You got Aharon of Levi, and then you got Elisheba of Yehuda. And so you had this Kodesh seed pop out from Moshe's brother, Aharon. Think about it. This is, Kodesh, this is why this Kodesh seed stuff is so important. Moshe's big brother, Aharon. So this is from the bloodline of Moshe. He married the leader of Nashon's wife. He didn't just marry anybody. I mean, the leader of Judah's wife. Sorry, sister. He married the leader of Judah's sister. He didn't just marry anybody. And because of that, they pushed out this Kodesh seed, this bloodline of people that Yahuwah said, okay, yeah, actually the only people who can even come in the a, in a Holy of Holies and, and meet with me face in that regard, the only people who can actually um, offer up the offerings of, uh, on the altar, the only people who can go into the holy place and um, offer up the offerings on the altar of, of, of incense are the children that came from this union. That's the significance of Kodesh Sheed. Now, what if I around like, man, I really like them Canaanites, though. <laughs> 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 yeah, that, would, that wouldn't have worked out, would it? Wouldn't have worked. Nashon came from a Kodesh She. You know, Nashon, if you look at his genealogy, that's what Yahushua actually comes out of The King David comes out of there. So Nashon, not only is he from the tribe of Judah, but he's from the Kodesh lineage of Judah. That actually led to King David and, and Yahushua HaMashiach. Like, look at Yahushua HaMashiach. Uh, it's in Luke chapter 2. We're not going to go there for time. I think it's Luke chapter 2. One of the, one of the uh, Gospels where they go through the genealogy of Yahushua. Hmm. Nashon is, 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 is in that lineage. So that's the bloodline that Eli Sheba came from. There's a Kodesh seed that came out. This is why, man, look, this Alua seed stuff ain't no joke. Yes, you talking about people like Pincus, then you go back, you talking about people like, um, and you wonder why, um, you know, you got Pincus, you talking about people like, um, Uh, man, well, I'm, I'm trying to think of the name. The Maccabees, yeah. Oh, that's what you said? I didn't hear you. Yeah, you're right on it, baby. Yeah, the, like the Maccabees, Mattathias. The, uh, they were descendants of, uh, uh, not just descendants of Levi, they were descendants of Aharon. And they rose up and led an insurrection against the Greeks and was whoop, putting a whooping on them. <laughs> this code at sea stuff is, is, is huge, y'all, because we're talking about, like, something that will, I mean, when you're talking about a redeemed bloodline, you're talking about your bloodline being on another level for, like, forever, basically. Like all these like mighty men coming through your, coming from your, um, basically from, from your body, like forever. Yeah, for people uh, who breed animals, I know some people who breed, uh, I know back there's some people who breed, bred pit bulls. Uh, one of my homeboys, Brad Pitt Bulls. Mm -hmm. And I remember how, how specific he used to be about wanting to put two, these two specific types of, of dogs together to, 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 put, to, to, to bring out like this desired seed. You'll have this one dog, he's like, yeah, I'm looking for the specific type of dog to mate with him.
everybody like, man, that dog, man, I got a, I got a girl, man, I got a, you know, we can split the litter. Oh, no, no, because there you go, yeah, yeah, I see you got those dogs, no, that's not what I'm looking for for this one. Not a a specific line. type I'm looking for for this one, yeah. That's why I can't just beat anybody in in the assemblies, uh, especially not no rebels, because the most high I'll look at it and be like, yeah, I can't duplicate that, though. Right. And like when it comes to the assemblies, he's starting all over with us. So you got to be in like a duplicate, yeah, you gotta be a duplicatable person. Yes. Let's go back to the meat bar. <clears throat> All right, what we're going to do is So it goes through the different tribes and, the, and and how many are in each tribe. Reverse 44. Verse 44, these are the ones who will number, whom Moshe and Aaron number, with the leaders of Israel, 12 men, each one representing his father's house. So all who were numbered of the children of Israel by their father's houses, from 20 years old and above, all who were able to go to war, in Israel, all who were numbered were 600 and 3,550. So you see the number six, that's the number for man, right? Mm -hmm. You see the number three, that's the number for resurrection. So when you're looking at this number, 603,550, right? So you see six and three, that's, a, that's, that's about the re the, some sort of resurrection of men happening. Then 550, so y'all know, know about the number five. Right. So that's basically um, 550, five, or five and 50, which is about Jubilee, which is about the regathering, which is about, I told y'all, it's about the hundredfold family. So that makes sense why you see those numbers in there with that total. Six hundred and three, five hundred and fifty. Six hundred three thousand five hundred and fifty. That made up the number that was accounted for in the wilderness. Those were the people that were accounted for. They had to be named. They had to be I mean they went through each tribe by the genealogies. They had to declare their genealogies. They had to declare their ped pedigree. Let's see. Um, go back to verse 5. Read verse 5 again. No, never mind. No, leave it alone. All right, let's look at chapter two. Let's go to Numbers chapter, Mibar chapter two, read verse one, Mishpacha. 
and Yahuwah spoke to Moshe in Aharon saying, every one of the children of Israel shall count by his own standard beside the emblems in his father's house. They shall count some distance from the tabernacle of meeting on the east side toward the rising of the sun. So it says, uh, verse 2, every one of the children of Israel shall count by its own standard. So that's like a banner beside the emblems. That's oat. So that's a mark or a sign. You see what I'm saying? Of his father's house. So now the most house like, yeah, now that we have the leadership established, who's going to be the heads of each tribe, the heads of the houses, now we want each person to camp based off of the house they're in. Mm -hmm. That's where y'all need to dwell. That's where y'all need to be at. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Y'all just think about it, y'all. Uh, oh, snap. I, ain't, I just caught that. <laughs> oh, snap. That's crazy. Yeah. But um, mm. as far as um, as far as that goes, as far as the um, so they were accounted for by their father's houses. So so um, if you're of of Judah, you're of Judah, Yehuda. That was their fathers. You're of Simeon, then you're of Simeon, the tribe of Simeon. That was their fathers. You see what I'm saying? Uh, they were accounted for by their father's houses. And there was a sign for each one. So here's an artist's rendition here. Now the order was established and so the tabernacle was raised up. So now order was established to where you have the tribes laid out in a certain order and orderly ranks. You notice that Judah is right at the door. They're right at the east. So they're positioned right by the door of the tabernacle. Uh, they're right by where Moshe and Aharon stand at the door as well. Very interesting, huh? Very interesting, especially since Aharon and his sons come from Judah. He married, a, uh, 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 his, his wife is from Judah, so, you know, that's probably what's through for his wife. She can still be with her people, be with Nashon, her brother and them, they be close to each other. <laughs> pretty interesting. But there's always been a, um, a pretty interesting um, correlation between Yehuda and the priests. Not Yehuda and the Levites, but Judah and actually the, the priesthood, the, the, um, the sons of, of the Aharon. There's always been a relationship with each other, and it's probably because it started off, that whole relationship was between Judah and Levi, Judah and Aaron. Uh, because you saw that even in, a, in the days of uh, Dad Dawi, he had this priest, Zadok, and uh, Zadok, you ended up starting all over with Zadok. Uh, to where his lineage made up the priesthood. But um, this also brought protection to the tabernacle. Because now you got the Akim surrounding the house. See what I'm saying? 603,000 ready for battle, right? They surrounding the house. So now it's like, man. And then the house made the center of the camp where the offerings would go up, where the Most High dwelled in the midst. Remember, uh, Yahuwah walks in the midst of the camp. And that passage, Deuteronomy 23, was in reference to the wilderness. Yahuwah walks in the midst of the camp. Uh, go back to Numbers chapter 1 verse 3 it says from um, 
20 years old and above, all who are able to go to war in Israel. You and Aharon shall number them by army. So all who are able to go to war, that word for war is Zaba or Saba. It actually has the connotation of who, those who are able to do the service. Uh, if you look at that word Saba. Hosts, war, army, battle, service. It has a connotation of those who are able to do the work as well, those who are able to do the service. Um, go to First Chronicles 25. Y'all there? Yeah. All right, let's start at verse one. Moreover, Dawid and the captains of the army separated for the service some of his sons of Asaph, of Heman, and of Judathon. Who should do what? Who should prophesy with the harps, stringed instruments, and cymbals. And the number of the skilled men performing their service was of the sons of Asaph, Zakor, Joseph. We can stop there. Because you notice it says that David and the captains of the army separated and had basically organized the musicians. It was the soldiers, the captains of the army who did that. So what this is showing is that this is proof this is showing that music was a form of warfare. Right. That's why it was the it was the captains of the army who were um organizing the mu musicians. So that they can prophesy with harps and string instruments. What y'all think they prophesy? Mm. They declar they declaring. Remember, we, we resurrected the, ta who has us to resurrect the tabernacle of David? What you think they were? Y'all, yeah, it don't say what they was doing in here, but Yahuwah showed us the tabernacle of Dawi through worship, through the, Yahuwah showed us directly. He didn't show it, he, he didn't bring it out specifically how the, how the tabernacle of Dawu moved in the scriptures. And I, you know why? But I submit it's because if he did that, Man, you boy, you would have had the Chinese trying to do the Tabernacle of David. Boy, you would have had, man, boy, you would have had the, man, you would have had the Cowboy Church in uh, Willacoochee, Georgia, and they would have been Tabernacle of David. Two stepping. You would have had all the nations trying to move in that. So there were certain things you wouldn't specify in the scriptures. It was on purpose, for real. That's gonna come through revelation. It's gonna come through the ruach to the people who we wanted to know, to know what it is. You see what I'm saying? Uh, because he knew this, that this book, that these scriptures would go across the nations. It'll go across the world. And if there were certain things put in there, it would get towed up, for real. We know what was happening, man, when they was prophesying, when the soldiers, it was the soldiers. Who got the who, who had the, uh, the the musicians set apart uh, south for them so that they can prophesy with the stringed instruments? They declaring, right. declaring against the people they finna fight, Dang. declaring against the enemies. So they pray. So with, with, with a barrage of declarations against the enemy first, you do that for a few days, then you move in and advance. Oh, it's over. All over. Yep. It's done. That's the tabernacle of David. How did David? How was David able to subdue all these, all the enemies around him? And it seemed like it was just easy. It was like Dawid would come and he would, he would, he would go and subdue Moab, Ammon. Then he went over there and he subdued the Philistines. When you read about David, man, how was he able to do this? The tabernacle of David. He had the Malachim going before him because he, 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 had, he had sent the musicians uh, but probably to be doing declarations and the prophesy. They dispatching Malachim first. 
And then they'll go in and it's done. Uh, do a Let's look at Isaiah 43. <clears throat> Isaiah 43, we'll start with verse 1. Everybody there? But now, thus says Yahuwah, who created you, O your code, and who, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have what? I have redeemed you. We've just been talking about that. Keep going. I have called you by your name. Isn't that what happened um, in the book of Amoeba? We see that... Um, that he called them by name. Yahuwah said, these are the people I want you to set up as leaders. And then they established themselves and those who, who were accounted for by those leaders, they were, they were Thub. Yes, sir. They were Thub, they were written in the book. They were written in the book of life. Couldn't we call Torah the book of life? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yahuwah says in it you find life. He says, I have said before you, blessings and cursings, life or death, mm -hmm. choose life. life. What does he mean when he says choose life? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right, keep the commandments. Mm -hmm. Choose life. And so in a certain sense, I know there's a, a you know, I know there's a Ruako book of life, of course, that we, you know, but in a sense, you can also look at the Torah as a book of life. That's why there's people's names in it written genealogically in there. It's showing that their names was written, that they were inscribed in the books. That they were accounted for. There's a, you got the book of numbers or where it goes through these different genealogies. You go through, there's, there's several other uh, chapters where there's these, it goes through this line of names. This is not you, this is not meant to be written, I mean to be read like a story. These are literal genealogical records that we read. These are records. Get what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Historical records. If you ever went to, um, so for, you know, this is the governmental, like if you ever went to try to, you know, some people might have went to try to do research on your lineage and uh, maybe you went to uh, one of those public record places, you had to go to the town, the county, whatever. What they call it, a county some appraiser? Not the appraiser. A county assessor, assessor, something like that. And then you go and you, uh, you know, and then you can get, look at the, look at the different records. They re and uh, you can see uh, maybe your, your grandma's name, you can find it and then you can, and they'll go over and they'll go over who your grandma and maybe uh, who her siblings were when she was born. It'll show records. These are just records. Mm -hmm. that's, what we, that's, what we, that's what we be reading in certain parts of the Torah. That's all it is, not a, like a story. His records proving these are who the people were. These are the people that were accounted for in the wilderness that were uh, a part of this order. They are accounted for. They are written. That's what, it's interesting, y'all, because that's what this Pesach, uh, this, what, that's the aspect of what this Pesach was about. That's why we, man, listen. Let, let me ask you something. For real. This, I mean, y'all got to think about this, man. For real. If you decided, man, look, this wilderness thing ain't for me. Um, I'm gonna still serve Yahuwah though. I, I'm, I'm gonna still serve the Most High, <laughs> but I'm gonna go on back over there to Egypt. <laughs> back <to> Babylon. <laughs> I'm gonna go back over there to Egypt because you know they still my they they still said man at my job. You know what I'm saying? Um, because of my job, and they still man they need me over there, and you know, uh, but I'm gonna still serve Yahuwah though. You think you threw if you did that? Mm -hmm. 
Are you in the kingdom if you do that? I mean, I'm going to still keep Torah. I'm going to still, I ain't going to leave you. Who? I'm telling you, I ain't going to. But I'm just not, you know, me and Moshe don't really get along like that. <laughs> and, um, and my job in Egypt, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. <laughs> ain't that what we be doing, man? Yep. Nah, I was just saying that we think that I'm going to disobey Yahuwah here, but I'm going to go obey him over here. Because what he said here was too hard, so I'm going to go over here and do what's easy and obey him. <laughs> so we, so we, we out here like Jonah. And Yahuwah was, th- was pleased with Jonah, right? He just let Jonah do what he wanted to do. <laughs> like, yeah, nah, Yahuwah, I don't want to go to Nineveh. I'm going to just go to Tarshish and serve you. That ain't work, did it? Nah. Listen, man, listen. This is, this is important. Aren't we in the wilderness of the peoples? Yes, sir. Okay, let me ask you this for real. They've been accounted for. They've been accounted for by their houses. So let's say if one of the people in the wilderness did something and got kicked out. Uh, was there anywhere else they can go to or something like that and they've been most how be through with them? Or did that mean that they was done? They was out of the kingdom. There were Israelites who didn't go in the wilderness. There were Israelites who chose to stay in Mitzrayim. There's whole, uh, li- there, there's whole uh, tribes in West Africa right now who that's their, that is their, um, that is their oral tradition that they're Israelites, but they didn't go into uh, the, the wilderness when everybody else did. They decided to stay and they went a different direction. This is where the tabernacle was. This is where everything was at. If you wasn't in the wilderness with this group, you, you, there, wasn't, what, was, there wasn't nothing else. This was it. That's why even though there was a whole world out there, the scriptures are honing in on this people group in this wilderness. Mm. Hallelujah. There was a whole mixed multitude that was in the wilderness. There was this people, a whole lot of people from Egypt. There was people from these other nations. Well, they decided, you know what, I'm going to just go, I'm going to still serve you. Who I'm going to just go back to Moab where I'm from. Because my mama and them, my mama and them, yeah. They, they, you know, they, they had reached out. I need to go because my cousin and them, they over there. Yeah, no. We're going to see actually the um, mixed multitude is going to actually really, really go. They're going to go in in the little bit. Of, I think it's the next tour portion. I think it's like ch- it's a chapter eight, something like that. Mm-hmm. They're going to want to go back to Egypt. It's. The mixed multitude. (laughs) They weren't in captivity. They wanted to go back. Comfort zone. You out. Now. It's just something to think about. It's just something to think about. Those seven assemblies in the book of Revelation, Yahuwah honed in on them. I don't believe it was nothing else out there. That's why. For real. When Yahushua came and he had uh, his, that big follow in Jerusalem, he had the apostles, he had the following of the people that followed him, and that was it. There wasn't nothing else out there. What about what was going on in China there in that time? Hmm. 
What was going on in Russia during that time? That's where the Most High was at. He was in Jerusalem with Yahushua and his followers and the people who was following his followers. There's probably some, there's probably always an exception out there. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I know like Yithro, that might have been, you know, can't really tell, you know. He was, a, he was a priest. You know, you just can't really tell. There's probably some exceptions out there, but we're not talking about exceptions right now. Generally speaking, the wilderness, that was where the Most High was at. That was it. The wilderness uh, group that we're looking at right here. If you can't, Say you with Issachar, whoever, whoever the leader was Issachar was, I can't remember his name, but let's say, I remember the Judah, so we'll say that. If you can't say, uh, if Nashon, you can't walk up to Nashon and he'll be like, oh yeah, 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 come on, I know, yeah, yeah, he threw. Right. If you're not accounted for by any of the heads of these tribes, you're not in, you're not, you, you're not in the kingdom. Why was the tabernacle, remember the tabernacle is, is, it symbolizes the kingdom. That's, because remember the tabernacle, the holy place, that's like going into the, uh, the throne, like the throne room and then really the holy of holies is the throne room. Mm -hmm. But the holy place is symbolic of going into the, uh, the, the domain of Yahuwah, you know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Um, and so going inside of the courtyard of the tabernacle symbolized being like in the Shamayim. That's what it was about, being in the kingdom. Y'all get it? But you notice that the tabernacle, in order to get there, you had to go through one of these, didn't you? Mm. It's around it, wasn't it? Oh, man, I like it. It's starting to ring a bell mm. in Revelation. Because in Revelation, let's go there. I ain't going to, let's go there. Revelation 22. Oh, it was in Revelation 21, I think. It was 21, yeah. Yeah, Revelation 21. Remember, um, part of the, uh, the mission is to build the... No, the mission, to build the... The new Jerusalem. Okay, let's do Revelation 21, verse 2. Y'all there? Go ahead. Uh... Bakir Aloof. Then I, John, saw the Kodesh city, New Jerusalem. The coming. what? Kodesh city. And what is it called? New Jerusalem. Isn't that part of the mission to build the new Jerusalem? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's look what it says. Coming down out of Shamayim from Alua. Aren't we, didn't we come down out of the Shamaim? Isn't that one of the revelations that, that Yahuwah showed us? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. We are Malachim from the Shamaim. We are sons of light. Hallelujah. We are citizens of the new Jerusalem. We've Hallelujah. come down out of the Shamaim. From Alua. Yeah, prepared as what? Prepared as a bride adorned for her. Her husband. That's covenantal language. Because we are the people of Yahusha, the covenantal bride of Yahusha. Keep going, keep going. And I heard a loud voice from the Shamayin saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Alua is with men. Oh, snap, y'all see that? Say it again. Behold the what? Behold, the tabernacle of Alua is with men. And he will dwell the with them. The tabernacle of Alua is with man. Don't that ring a bell? Y'all see this on the, on the TV? Mm -hmm. But in Revelation, it's referring to the new Yerushalayim. It's referring to us. Yes, sir. The tabernacle of Alua is with men. Okay, because remember... It wasn't until the tabernacle was erected, then, okay, oh, Yahuwah was like, okay, y'all got to set up order, and we got to set some things up. All right, behold, the tabernacle of Lua is with man, and he will what? 
and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Alua himself will be with them and be their Alua. And Alua will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Okay, go to verse 9. Then one of the seven Malachim, who had the seven bowls, filled with the seven last plagues. Who are the seven Malachim? Right, they're the heads of the seven assemblies. When you read the book of Revelation, it starts off where Yahuwah goes into the seven assemblies. Um, and the, the heads of the assemblies were called the Malachim. They were called angels. That's what the whole book of Revelation was written to. It was to the seven assemblies. That's what I'm telling y'all. At this time, the seven assemblies was it. That's why. I submit that was that was it. So there was probably people from all around the the, the, the exile that traveled to join these seven assemblies. People sacrificed a lot to come and move and be in uh, in Laodicea, to be in Philadelphia, to be to join one of these to be under one of these heads of one of these seven assemblies. Some of y'all did the same thing. There's nothing new under the sun. I'm sorry. I'm, if, if that was what was it, that's what, because when, when Revelation was written, the temple was destroyed. That already had happened. Rome had already overtaken Jerusalem. So then you had these seven assemblies scattered throughout the, uh, the exile. Well, they weren't scattered that much, but they were in the exile. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Oh, uh, where was I at? I forgot where I was at. I'm Verse sorry. 9. You Verse nine. Okay. Then one of the seven Malachim, who had the seven bowls filled with seven last plagues, filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Verse 10. And he carried me away in the Ruach to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the Kodesh Jerusalem. So he showed him, he's showing him the new Jerusalem. Descending. Out of the Shamaim from Alua. This is about us, keep going. Having the glory of Yahuwah. Uh, Having the uh, kabod of Alua, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she had a great and high wall with 12 gates. With 12 what? 12 gates. Keep going. And the 12 Malachim at the gates. The names were written on them which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So 12 gates. There were 12 Malachim at the gates. So there were Malachim guarding the 12 gates. Those 12 Malachim were probably the leaders of the tribes. It's interesting that Radayahu Yahu kept hearing, appointed over souls. Appointed over souls. They served as gates to the kingdom. The way the, 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 the Yahuwah had this set up is that the tribe served as gates to the kingdom. You weren't getting in there unless you were accounted for by what you got to go through one of these gates. Mm. Matter of fact, let me find, I, that was a, I have a little bit better. Let me use this one. This one seems a little bit more through. Uh, let me try to use this one. This is one of some of them that I used over the years. So these are different ways it could have been um, it could have been 
And that's similar to the last one. But nevertheless, this the point is, in order to get to the kingdom, you gotta you gotta get through a, you gotta get through the lift up your roche, O oh ye. And remember, the book of Amibar is all about counting the roche, counting the heads. Because, it's, because the Kodashim serve as gates to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Because these assemblies serve as gates to the kingdom. Is there anywhere else? I don't know. I don't know. But just looking at the patterns of the scriptures, that's all I can go off of. It ain't impossible that this is, the, that this is where it's at. It's not impossible. I can say this, though, for y'all, this is it. I can say that. Because like uh, Bakir Yamin uh, was saying is, is as are, are alluding to, if the Most High called you to be here, that means this is it. If He called you to be here, that means this is where you're supposed to be. So if you mess it up because you rebelled, or you did something crazy, or you offended the Most High by how you was moving, uh, or anything like that, and then you get removed, that's it. That's it. We've seen it, y'all. Look, we've seen it. We've seen it uh, to where people get removed out of here and then just go reprobate. Mm -hmm. yep. Oh, now um, the law's done away with. For real. <laughs> or now um, Yahushua ain't it. All of a sudden, for real. But what will happen is that the Most High will harden your heart, man. If you offend him in a way, uh, through your actions, through your iniquities, he'll make it to where you don't even have the ability to choose him. He'll harden your heart, and you'll be walking around talking about Kemet. <laughs> for real. <laughs> You'll be walking around talking about Kemet. You'll be dabbling in witchcraft and everything. And everybody's wondering what in the world happened. The most high hard in his heart because he was moving in rebellion. He had a chance, but he moved in rebellion. The most high hard in his heart. So now he, don't, he won't even, he, he don't even have a chance to serve the most high. Hmm. He's sealed, sealed. Those who get the mark of the beast, that's what's going to happen. Those who had a mark of the beast. That's why y'all got to be careful. Don't be debating with, with certain people, man. You can bring out the truth, but going back and forth with somebody in witchcraft, they probably seal. They probably have the mark of the beast on them. That's why they're never going to see it. Mm -hmm. Debating with somebody who Torah only, who's saying Yahushua ain't it, going back and forth with them for hours. Man, they probably sealed. Mm -hmm. They're not going to see it. Wasting your time. Then you get done, you have to talk for hours, you're frustrated. Can't believe it. They just, you know, I showed them it's right here in the scripture. They, I don't know. <laughs> and I messed up your whole day dealing with somebody who's sealed. <laughs> mm -hmm. They took the mark of the beast. They just ain't tell you. They done made some sort of oath or did something to, uh, to cause their heart to be hardened. That's all that is. So you just got to uh, be careful with that. But y'all, that's a whole nother level when y'all, knowing that y'all are Malachim and knowing that y'all are the gates. Hallelujah. It says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. Oh, snap. Doors to the house, man. 
everywhere you go, understanding that you're, you're, you're a pathway to the most high for anybody who, who wants to cling on to you. That's a whole nother, man, that's a whole nother level of way of thinking. Yeah. So just keep that in mind. Let's keep, uh, we're about to wrap it up. So, um, so priest is the Hebrew word kohen. So they go through the priesthood, I believe in chapter three. So Kohen is about those who impart, see the hand, the hand to impart, to lay hands, to impart the Ruach into the seed. I can't remember if it was the Ruach or Revelation. Those who impart the Ruach into the seed. Kohen, priest. Um, that's why impartation is so important. That's why um, when you do a sacrifice, when the priest did the sacrifice, uh, they had to put two hands onto the, to the animal. And then they, had a, then, they, then they would slaughter it and put an offer it up. Um, but the priest, a telltale sign of a priest is that he can impart he can do the laying on of hands. I remember um, when I first um, started uh, seven years ago, we first started with Rebirth ATX. Um, the concept of deliverance, laying on of hands or anything like that was foreign to me. It was. I was uh, primarily um, focused on just teaching the word and I was, I was making sure we keeping the commandments and Yahushua and, 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 Yahu and Yahushua. You know what I'm saying? I went to the, uh, we had a leader, one of the first leadership meetings with the Maleks and they did the laying on of hands and impartation. Um, and that's when that stuff started with me. I was super, super, super intellectual. It was all about, you know, doing your research and breaking down, you know, the, the, the Hebrew and things like that, you know. Um, and then uh, after the laying on of hands, um, that's when I started moving in deliverance. Like they literally were able to impart stuff into me that enabled me to start doing things they were doing, for real, that's, that's priests. As a priest, uh, start moving in that. Then there was, uh, you know, other things I desire. You know, uh, I remember with uh, wanting to uh, move in uh, speaking in other languages, speaking in the Ruach, speaking in tongues. I, it was foreign to me when I first came into this. I, was, I didn't go to no church that did none of that. So I, I was foreign to me. Other than in the scriptures, reading it in the scriptures, the same thing with deliverance. I mean, I believed it. I read it in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't, no, I didn't go to no church that did that or nothing like that. So that was foreign to me as far as actually moving in that. Um, but man, after just the laying on of hands multiple times throughout the years, man, I was just laying down one day and it was um, Yom Kippur and I just heard tongues. I was laying down, it was Yom Kippur, I was waking up and kind of still half sleep and just heard tongues, went into the prayer closet and started praying and started speaking in tongues. Wow. Mm, hallelujah. I always was a dreamer, even uh, before um, this, I was always a dreamer, but um, as far as visions, that was different. Was the laying on of hands. <laughs> and I'm going to my prayer closet, you know what I'm saying? And there's time to time. I still, I, some of y'all are super seers, though. I, I, you know, I don't be, uh, yeah, nah. I, I, I don't be just seeing all the time. Like some of y'all be seeing all the time. But, man, I was going to my prayer closet, and there are times 
in the times of the medication, meditation, <laughs> meditation. <laughs> medication. Uh, and the most high would send me, send me visions. Like, man, hold up. The visitations from Malachim. Now, I did used to get attacked by Ruachs yeah. um, way before this. But the visitation about Malachim, that was foreign to me. <laughs> Y'all get the gist of it? So, so then, after that was done to me, I, I knew how to start doing that to, to the Mishpaka here. So, then I'm moving, I'm doing the laying on of hands and then pardoning to the Mishpaka here, and then they start moving in the stuff. That the Melakim were moving, and you know, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll be like, man. Man, I just had this dream last night, the boo, the boo, the boo, man, I saw this melt, my lock came, and man, all this stuff, man. <laughs> like, all praise to the Most High. Sometimes they don't put two and two together, hey, that was because of that impartation yesterday. But it's all right. I won't say nothing. Like, man, that's dude, man. I'll pray to the most high. Hmm. Have you ever had that? Was anything like that? No, I ain't never had nothing like that before. Like, man, told that to you. That's a Kohen. You have the ability to do that, to impart. Um, another aspect of that, this, though, is, is the Kohen are those who give information to the seed, though, too. Because another aspect of revelation is information. Remember, Rada has the hey, you know what I'm saying? Who has access to the revelation? He has access to the information. Um, chief, uh, you know, chief over the access to the information. So the Kohen are the ones who are supposed to be able to give teachings. They're supposed to be able to give information to the seed through teachings. Um, Yahuwah would speak to Moshe, he would give Moshe the word, he would say, yeah, tell the children of Israel this, and what would Moshe do? He would go and then in turn, he would give that information to the Mishpaka. That's a, that's a priestly function, you get what I'm saying? To receive something from Yahuwah, and then go and then bring it out to the Mishpaka, just giving the information to the seed, you see what I'm saying? That's why a lot of the prophets were priests. Yermiyahu who actually came, he was the son of Hilkiah. Hilkiah was a high priest. He was a son of Aaron, descendant of Aaron. Hilkiah was a high priest during the times of Josiah. Hilkiah was the one who found, y'all remember the story of Josiah when the priest had found the Torah again? That was Yermiyahu's dad, the prophet Yermiyahu. Uh, yeah. Ezekiel, he was, a, he was a priest. I don't know if he was Kohen, though. I don't know if he's son of Aaron. Pretty sure though. Yeah, because I'm pretty sure the scripture said he was a priest, so that would have made him son of Aaron as well. But um, a lot of these prophets, that's why they were priests, um, because they did these things. They gave information to the seed. Yahuwah would give it to them, then they would in turn go and try to give it to the seed. You know, the prophets dealt with the man. Them prophets, boy, they had to deal with a lot though. Yeah, Yasharel was rebellious a lot of times. But the priest is all about giving, giving, giving to the seed, giving, serving. You see what I'm saying? But me, bar chapter one, verse 51, it says, and when the tabernacle is to go forward, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be set up, the Levites shall set it up. And look what it says. The who? Outsider. Who comes near shall be put to death. The children of Israel shall pitch their tents, everyone by his own camp, everyone by his own standard according to their armies. But the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony that there may be no wrath on the congregation of the children of Israel, and the Levites shall keep charge of the tabernacle of the testimony. 
So it had to be an order because any outsider who came up in the domains, who came in and trespassed, they would be they had to be put to death. That was the Torah. You get what they this is what they saying. Anybody going there that's not supposed to, the judgment is death. Nah, it's not saying that, listen, this is not saying that Yahoo is gonna strike them down. Nah, this is saying that anybody trespassing and they're not supposed to, uh, the judgment is you're supposed to put them to death. That's the judgment. And that was the judgment for, the, for, for Levi to make that judgment. You see what I'm saying? That's why Phinehas pierced them through. Phinehas was the son of Aaron. Y'all know, y'all know the story? Phinehas, this is the book of Numbers. Remember the story of Phinehas happened later in the book of Numbers. They were at the temple when they were laying with the women of Do Moab. Because when they were laying with the women of Moab, it said that the people were at the temple weeping when this happened. So that, and they were able to see the two people laying together. So in order for that to happen, that means the two people laying together were in the temple. You get it? Why? Because the temple had a, the, the tabernacle, the, I mean the tabernacle. Think about it, y'all. The tabernacle has a whole wall around it. So if the people who were weeping at the door saw what you calling them laying with each other, they had to be inside the walls. So that put them inside the jurisdiction of the priests. Any outsiders ought to be put to death. Anybody who trespasses or sins against the Kodesh things ought to be put to death. That's why Yahuwah made a covenant of salt with Phineas. Phineas just didn't randomly just kill them because they were sinning. That was not random. If they were outside of his jurisdiction, that might have been because they had to have been, a, in order to put somebody to death for iniquity, there, according to Torah, there's a lot of things that had to be put into place. You actually, it has to be two to three witnesses. Then you got to go before the courts and it has to go through a system before they would have to actually be put to death, can be put to death. That's according to Torah. So when it says that Phineas has ran up while they were laying with each other and thrust them through and you was like, oh yeah, I'm pleased with you. Oh man, let me get, I'm covenant of the salt. This is because that was in his jurisdiction as a son of Aaron to be able to do, because according to Numbers 1, you're to put to death any outsider. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. but it's about protecting the Kodesh things. This is uh, just showing how you even have certain animals that do certain things like that to protect what's in them, to protect what's precious to them, to protect the seed. Like you're not getting to them unless you go, you gotta go through one of them. You know why? Cause they know there's all kind of lions out there, wolves. And beasts out there that could try to seep in. And when you think about the tabernacle, the tabernacle actually is very closely, uh, it looks very close to an ancient sh sheep pen. That's an ancient sheep pen. So you got the tabernacle right here. And they literally, y'all know the daily sacrifices, they had sheep in there all, every day, all day. Literally. Because they had to do the daily sacrifices every boker in the rail. And it was required that you had to have, uh, I can't remember how many sheep that was part of the daily sacrifices every day. So, I mean, that's really like a sheep pen. It's about protecting the sheep surrounding it and protecting the gates. But told out to Yahuwah and Yahusha, all praise to the Most High.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, so we got a few things in here. Uh, oh, so yeah, Nasita. So what happens is during the lesson, uh, you're in this chat. It's called the Rebirth ATX Questions and Comments. So during the lesson, people will drop like questions and comments in the chat. Oh, is she in the chat? Con, I'm my editor. I'll pray to the most high. So this is from Hoda. I just prayed about this on my way to Shabbat, thanking him for purging the rebels and how man looks at the outward appearance, but Yahuwah looks at the heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, that word for rebel was interesting. It was Mirad, Memresh, Dalit. And when you look at the, the uh, brown, you look at the um, dictionary, it said that it's rebellion against a, man, uh, a king against, oh man, I just looked at it. Let me see. I thought this was pretty interesting because it goes along with what you were saying. What did you say? Oh, I thought you said something. Okay. Yeah, it says rebellion to uh, rebel or revolt against a human king, against a lure, and against light. So you, what you said was that, man, it don't have to be that you did some sort of a sin. You can just rebel against order. Like, who is like, hey, this is going to be the order, and you can rebel against that. Or you can, you know, obviously, if you rebel against a lure like Jonah, or you can rebel against a human king. That's pretty interesting. Man, that's real. Because we don't really think about that, because he's like, hey, I will purge out the rebels and those who transgress. And I hadn't thought about it that way till you said it. But, yeah. So, Uriel, she said 6 plus 3 plus 5 plus 50. Well, let me say this real quick. Oh, go ahead. Though. Yes, sir. Also, with purging the rebels, uh, that word, what is it? What is it? What is it Mara? Mirad. Memresh Dalit. Memresh Dalit. Okay. Okay, never mind. I was thinking it was about like Mara, like, like bitter, but never mind. That's different. So Uriel put 6 plus 3 plus 5 plus 50 equals 64. And then 6 plus 4 equals 10. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting, man. Ten is a number for obedience. So then I dropped what you was, then I dropped what you was talking about, Ezekiel being a priest. You spot on. That's Ezekiel 1-3. Uh, yeah. yeah, so he was of the lineage of Levi. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Hoda said, Moab weren't Moab weren't even supposed to be there. It says they can't ever enter into the congregation of Yahuwah. Nah, no, no, you're making a, you, no, that's an important point though, um, Hoda, because so, so there was a mixed multitude that were amongst Israel. There was a mixed multitude that was amongst the wilderness. And so, but you had, so you, that means you have Moabites you had all these other nations in there. Then the Most High gave, so it's about producing Kodesh seed. You see what I'm saying? So you had this mixed multitude and they were in these tribes. They were, they were, they were numbered amongst that 603,550. And so that's why, they, and this is how you know, you, when you who have made those Torah precepts that a, a Moabite can't enter the congregation, an Egyptian can't enter the congregation, not until the third, fourth generation. He's saying that because what does a mixed multitude do? They join Yashorel, they're a part of the camp, and so what happens is they start mixing with the children of Israel. That's naturally going to happen. Their, their sons and daughters will be marrying to other sons and daughters in the camp, things like that, and so then most I put these Torahs out. Okay, well, the Moabites, now they can't enter, they can't, they can't enter, you know what I'm saying? The Egyptian can after the third or fourth generation. You let them know, you know. So, you know. So you know what you're doing. It's through, but, you know, in the third generation, it's going to you know, be about three or four generations before they can. And so now, you know, we're talking about entering in. That's a, that's a whole nother 
discussion as far as what that means, you know, does that mean it can't be in the camp at all? Or is it referring to more like being in the, um, being uh, accounted for, like can be a head, can be a roach, like being amongst, you know, things like that. Uh, but uh, that boils down to code that seed though. Let's keep going. Uh, Uriel said she had a comment. Um, when I was reading the Torah portion, I realized um, in Numbers 2, verse 3, it says, On the east side, towards the rising of the sun, those of the standard of the forces with Yehuda shall come according to their armies. And I, I just found that to be so interesting that um, the tribe of Yehuda was the one towards the rising of the sun. So I wondered if it had, if, you know, the tribe of Yehuda have anything to do with, you know, this rising of the sun that, um, we talk about. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Um, because the rising of the sun is also about, the rising of the sun is also about the regathering. And it's unto Judah that the gathering of the people shall be. You see what I'm saying? So yeah, that's all. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. It absolutely is, is uh, probably a Ruach or ass layer to why Yahuda was at the east. They were there where the door of the tabernacle was. It's, it's, it's unto them. The gathering of the people shall be. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's the two point. So it also, um, so the word Judah, as we know, that means praise. So when you think about light shining forth through Judah, right? Because from the east is where the light shines forth. It, that's, where, that's where the day begins. Light breaks forth into the darkness through the east where Judah is. So it makes sense because, you know, we talk about like, a, a, we'll just say Hasatan. But we talk about Hasatan being the, uh, the day star, right? In Isaiah, when it talks about how he was a day star, what that's saying is that, man, when he rose up, man, everybody, like, the light shined forth from him. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Judah, in, you know, in many ways, Judah was the replacement of that. Yeah. So Judah being at the east, I think that is, you know, another reason that's significant. Because from Judah shall a gathering of the people be, and it's like the gathering of the people comes through praise, which is why it's interesting that, you know, one of the number one things that people hate rebirth about is praise. That's the number one thing, because they're like, man, this is, this is just not through. Who gave them this power? Bakir Ezra Hadassah, Revelation 21.6, and he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the foundation of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. We saw waters today. Mm. Hoda said, very, very through blessing, Mushal. Really opened my eyes even more and allowed me to see in the scriptures on another level. Yahuwah is slick, sick, cyclical. What happened before happens again. Thank you for this manna from the Shamaim. Yeah, that's stupid to hear because, well, yeah, I was, I was tough today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was. <laughs> yeah, <man. laughs> Also about the Kodesh seed. I was at my mom's house the other day and Shiloh did something and my mom's husband was super impressed. He was like, what's up with these Hebrew babies? I'm starting to become a believer. I need to be over there and do what they doing. Man. What's up with Adrian and these super babies? <laughs> oh, that's hilarious, but yeah. <laughs> they do got some super babies though, man. Yeah, that's, that's where we at with that. 
And then uh, Bakir's Hadassah put the scriptures in the chat. And that is all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, no, we got a late break and entry. Um, my question was for when Mushal was talking about the, um, uh, the tribe in Africa, the ones that went north instead of going with everybody else, will they have a chance ever to be in this gathering? So um, not the Igbo, the Igbo, were, uh, they, were, they were through, but... Um, so as far as there are in individuals from any, pretty much from any nation can join Yasharel and, and be in the kingdom. Individuals. But no, they were never accounted for as a tribe or a clan or family um, as far as, uh, how the best way to put it, uh, of the 12 tribes of Yasharel. That makes sense? So, um, They'll just be considered Gentile, you know, they'll be considered Gentile. They can join Israel and be in the kingdom, though. If they submit to Yahuwah and, you know, keep his commandments, things like that, they're going to have to, um, you know, basically join Israel through, a, through one of the 12 tribes, yep. you know, in a sense, through one of the gates. Um, but um, there are some clans and families from Gad uh, in, in West Africa who uh, they, just, they, they didn't go that route. So that's why most of them ain't really trying to serve the Most High anyway. It was one dude we thought was, and he was way off. Um, so, you know, that's just, uh, that's how that works. You get what I'm saying, though? Man. They're basically Gentiles. To, just to land back, uh, I heard Malek Yahusha use this example. He says, man, you know, you was, you was married, right? You was married, you went to the wedding, but if you if you had this wedding and you decided not to show up are you married because see it goes back to covenants so one of the things that you know just being in america um being in babylon we just don't really understand the the concept of covenants that's why what happened at pesach 2022 was just such a big deal because if you weren't at pesach 2022 then you have to be you have to join to the covenant in a different way like it wasn't really made with you if you was not there because um so the same thing with mount sinai like if you wasn't at mount sinai then you was not married to yahushua you wasn't married to yahuwah because that was a whole that mount sinai was a wedding party it was a celebration it was a purification turns were discussed there was a ketubah that was signed like all the elements that was needed for a Hebraic wedding was present there. So if you weren't there, then you weren't married. And I've heard people say, well, it says that I make this covenant with you in, your, in, in those who are not there. So it's talking about everybody. So you're telling me that the, you, you got Asian people married to Yahuwah now? Right? The Russians are married to Yahuwah? No, it's talk, that, when it says about those who were not there, it's talking about you. It's talking about us. Because it was like your, uh, your descendants, like the covenant is made with blood. That's why it just goes back to what I was trying not to talk too much, man. But it goes back to what you was talking about earlier in the lesson about, about blood, really. Because uh, the covenants are all made with blood. That's why you were talking about marriage and how you got to be careful. Like, man, you just can't just go marry anybody. You was talking about uh, Judah and Levi, how they married together. The covenant was made through blood. So... Um. Anyway, that's why. That's why. Yeah, that's a lot with that. But yeah. So, no, just to reiterate, now that's huge. With Sinai, if you weren't there, the only other people that would be a part of that covenant are the descendants of the people that were there. You get it? You either were there or you were from the bloodline of the people that were there. That's the only people that are part of that covenant. That's why the Kodesh seed stuff became such a big deal. Because it's done. It's done. So, you know, um, 
you want you want we, we want to bring forth Code Dead Seed who's see there's a there's a there's been a for those who are in that covenant there's something that happened to their body there's something in the DNA that'll pass passed down to the children y'all this nation is gonna be grow through being fruitful and multiplying through through the code that seeds you see what I'm saying but yeah I mean land back on the land back <laughs> so that's something Yahuwah was kind of showing me this week yeah ah, yeah yeah hallelujah that's something Yahuwah was kind of showing me this week Mushal because it's a um So it's about like these, these multiple things becoming one. And really, the only way that, there's only a few ways, there's really three ways that you can become one with something. Anything in the world can only become one with something by these three methods. You can only join things together, either fire, like you can melt things down and then join things together. And then those, those two things or multiple things then became one. Uh, pressure, if you, have, if you apply enough pressure, you can actually force something to become one just through pressure but then the other thing is chemically like for example glue right you wood glue you can take two sticks and make them one through wood glue but see that's what happened at the covenant because i was thinking about this thing this week and what you said was that there was a there was a like a dna change but that makes sense because as when you have a covenant if you if you get married you go you uh can't think of the kid friendly one what's the kid friendly version intimate intimacy so when you get married you become intimate with your bride but what do you do when you mm -hmm. when you consummate hallelujah praise you I married a teacher when you consummate you're releasing your soul into her that becomes this chemical change. Like there's studies on this, how the woman's DNA is changed when that happens. So that's the same thing Yahuwah did with us. It's like it was this covenant made. It was this covenant made, and then Yahuwah became intimate with us, and then released his ruach into us. So that's why it's changed. That's why like my son just can't go marry anybody he won't. Cause if he go marry somebody he want and then they marry somebody he want that whole that whole covenant my whole bloodline my whole well i got three of them so hallelujah for that but as far as through him like that's gone so it's just about understanding the covenant so you know if they weren't at mount sinai then they you know they weren't intimate with yahuwah so they did not get all the things that were they they should have got to maintain the covenant because they weren't there. They didn't, they didn't have the intimacy. Yahuwah didn't release their Ruach. That's exactly what happened. Musha went up and the Ruach fell on the 70 elders, even those who were in the camp. And they began to prophesy. They weren't prophesying before that. That's what Musha was saying. With uh, Kohen, told I. They weren't prophesying before that. So, uh, man, that's, that's, that's the land back on the land back on the land back. <laughs> okay, one more part to that question. Um, <laughs> when Michelle was talking about um, that you had, well, both of you, you had to be there, or it goes through your bloodline, or through those that were there. What if the, the ones that were there have adopted children? Would they be considered, I, I guess I, I would think smaller adopted children. So, yeah, if they were there, yeah, they do. They do. Because there were mixed multitudes that was there, and they got to uh, basically, you know, benefit from that as well. Can't kind of do question. Rebirth of a nation. Hebrew kingdom building.